city, which means that my whole, um, my, my background, my background soundscape is always sirens. So uh, just so we don't have things like that going on, we're gonna keep everybody muted. Um, but to kick things off, this is the straight edge of math and science host, um, hosted with me and Christina Warner. Um, and we have a number of artists joining us. And so we're really excited to do this. Um, and I'm gonna get started by showing you a couple of things so we can get a really brief kind of um, overview of what this, of what exactly the straight edge math, science and art is. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen with you and uh, I'm gonna show this to you as soon as I figure out how. I do this every single time, share screen. Okay, so I have, so one of the things that, um, you know, as my overview, um, I often talk about how I really got my start in the art world um, as an art historian. I am first and foremost an art historian and I draw all of my, um, all of my information from art historical precedent. Um, and today we're going to start with, unfortunately, we only have time to look at the Western um, history of math and science. I know that the Eastern folks, China, um, lots of people in the, uh, you know, in the Arab speaking world had had these math, math statics concepts down pat long before Westerners were even thinking about it. But that's, you know, because we were busy in the dark ages. But um, we're gonna go with the Western today because uh, it, it better suits what we've got going on and we'll have to do the Eastern at another juncture. But um, one of the most important things and one of the, the, the first developments in Western art history of, um, of really the first math and science kind of thing is in, um, it's with Filippo Brunelleschi who designed the famous Duomo and baptistry in Florence, Italy. Um, these are, he was really the, the sort of the father of Renaissance architecture and, um, and the father of what we now know as linear perspective. Uh, linear perspective was a revolutionary breakthrough in the history of art in particular because uh, prior to doing that, everything, everything that was painted, everything that was not an actual 3D object was always rendered in a 2D perspective. So images were flat. There was no foreshortening, you know, the way that somebody's arm reaches out to you, that could never be expressed. The way that you see things vanishing off behind me was never being expressed. Everything, all of the action was on one plane in front. Um, a lot like if you think about Egyptian hieroglyphics, if you think about the way that Egyptians had um, those images that aren't really, uh, that are very flat. They're rendered in perspective because that's the only way they were either rendered in perspective or front on because there was no other way to um, create any kind of depth. So Filippo Brunelleschi, the, the father of this architecture and actually modern engineering, um, kind of, if you ever see those, those guys standing in the street with this, um, I don't know, I'm not an engineer, so please forgive me if anybody knows what it actually is, you know, please feel free to step in at some point, but they, the ones that are doing the survey of the land and they have this tripod and they're looking through this little bitty lens, that's kind of what they're doing. They're looking for the, um, the perspective and the vanishing points in their, um, in their surveys. So here, Brunelleschi, I'm gonna to try to keep this much shorter, sorry guys. Brunelleschi discovered linear perspective, which is a way to, in, a way in which, if you look over here at this draw, at this painting by Mastaccio, the Holy Trinity, a way in which to create depth, um, a way in which to create the illusion of space, the foreground, the background, that there is um, space traveling behind a, a figure or something like that. He discovered it by creating a screen. He would screen somebody's eye, and then he would hold up a mirror, which would reflect this image back to them so that they could see that something was vanishing off into the distance. It's a little teeny point in the mirror. Um, so this is a tremendous breakthrough. Suddenly you find people using this everywhere and figures have depth, they have shape, they're rounded, you can see shoulders, you can see 
um, particularly in this piece by Masaccio, um, who later was really a master of linear perspective. Um, you see in the space behind Jesus and behind the saints, um, it recedes off into the distance and, and it feels like you could actually walk into that vault. So um, that's one of our first and most significant contributions to science and art. Um, later on, another really significant contribution is the use of the golden ratio. Um, fans of the Da Vinci Code will know what that means. <laughs> but uh, the, the golden ratio is a property which is expressed in nature and mathematics. It's uh, I'm not going to tell you the number because the number makes very little sense to me, but it's best, ex it's best expressed in the cross section of this Nautilus shell, which shows a ratio of space as it grows into space. Um, you see this happening with fractal imagery, which is something that Guy Austin is going to speak about later. Um, you see this happening in snowflakes and in treetops. Um, it's, it's really a, a, a ratio that exists and is so quote unquote perfect um, in almost every facet of life. So um, somebody who used this a great deal and, and indeed it was one of the first people to document it was Leonardo da Vinci, our very favorite um, polymath, engineer, scientist extraordinaire, um, man who first tried flight. I mean, the, the inventor of inventors. Leonardo da Vinci. Over here, we have a drawing from one of his codices called the uterus of the gravid cow, which reflects the shape of this nautilus shell and the golden ratio um, really very neatly. Um, later on, he would do things like this with the Mona Lisa, um, where you can see the golden ratio is employed in order to create what many artists felt by using this ratio of, of space in terms of, uh, of how the, the canvas was laid out, the image laid out on the canvas, it was really considered the most perfect slash aesthetically pleasing way to um, divide space and create an image. It was, um, it was written about in a, in a treatise by an artist and historian, historian named Luca Pacioli. And everything about the Renaissance was about being closer to God, expressing God's perfect expressing the beauty that God gave man. And so the ratio, the golden ratio, also known as the divine ratio, was, was given the importance because of the following. And I'm going to read it to you because I don't want to get it wrong. But it says, the golden ratio is so perfect, perf perfect <laughs> is because its value represents divine simplicity. Its definition invokes three lengths, symbolizing the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Its irrationality represents God's incomprehensibility. God has a plan and we as humans don't know. And its self-similarity recalls God's omnipresence and invariability. God is in everything we do. Um, so that is a very, very brief overview into the golden ratio. Um, I have another image over here, more Leonardo da Vinci, who on the science aspect of things, um, the first image that I showed you was that of a gravid cow, feeding a pregnant cow, a uterus of a pregnant cow. He's famous for his anatomy drawings. Um, he's famous for his explorations of the human body and the corpse. Uh, so here is a piece of that with uh, his shoulder anatomy. He was one of the first people to document anatomy in a way that is seen in anatomy textbooks the world over these days. So that's that. And then finally, one of another revolutionary um, aspect of math and science in the art world is the camera obscura, which is a, which was first documented um, actually by Leonardo da Vinci, believe it or not. Um, he, <laughs> he's pretty much taken care of everything for everybody who came afterwards. But a camera obscura is what later becomes a, an actual camera. It's, it's the same technology as a, um, as a, sh a mirror shutter camera a lens. And essentially what da Vinci discovered and many people before him, I mean, we're talking again about Western history, many people before him discovered that if you entered a very dark room and allowed light through a, a very small kind of aperture, a very small pinhole, an image of that light, the light would carry an image through to the opposite side of that very dark room and allow for you to, although it would be flipped, it would be upside down, it would also be left to right rather than right to left, 
Um, it would allow for an artist, it would allow for a sculptor, it would allow for whomever was interested in, in, in exploring space this way to almost trace an image off of this. You know, you could, you could have it sort of um, projected onto a, a piece of canvas or paper or something like that. And the artist would then be able to trace the imagery scene um, from, from that little teeny aperture. And a lot of us are familiar with this little teeny aperture kind of thing. Um, if we, uh, if you think about uh, solar eclipses, one of the things that we did as children when there were solar eclipses and we didn't have the glasses was poke a tiny pinhole in a piece of paper and hold it out so that a shadow could be cast underneath this paper. And then you would be able to see what the eclipse looked like on the ground. And that's very much how the camera obscura works. It's about create, it's about, it's an optical illusion creating a, uh, it's, it's actually a natural phenomenon, but an optical illusion that allows people to understand space in a way that is um, almost picture perfect um, sim similarity. So one of the most famous artists, well, it's very controversial actually and contentious who were supposed to have supposedly have used this camera obscura was Jan Vermeer, uh, the Dutch painter from um, born in 1632. He did a lot of domestic scenes, which were actually his own home. And um, from these domestic scenes, a lot of people, because of the precision of the imagery in, for example, this window pane over here, or the way that the floor tiles recede into the background, um, a lot of people, a lot of scientists and artists alike have posited that Vermeer was using a camera obscura in order to create this imagery, which is so technically precise, so technically perfected on, on a really fine detail. Um, so he, it, it, there's no evidence to say, Johann, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Vermeer, Johannes never left anything behind to suggest that he did use this. Um, a lot of people are just looking at the imagery and trying to interpret it. They know that at that time, the camera obscura was very widely used throughout Delft and Dutch Baroque painting. And they know that he was aware of it. So that is kind of why they have um, assumed that he also used it. Um, it's, it's, kind of, it's, a, it's a big argument, but um, an art historical one for another day, I suppose. Um, so now I'm gonna pass this off. That's our very, very brief and very broad art historical science and math um, introduction, but I'm gonna pass it off to Christina and let her and stop sharing my screen. Well, no, I'm gonna keep sharing my screen so Christina can see it, but pass it off to her so that she can talk a little bit about how it works in more modern artwork. Well, Alex, thank you so much for that great introduction. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. This is, this is very exciting. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit different from what we're used to be talking about with uh, the incorporation of math and science, but I do feel like there, there are some key examples that we're showing today that are good examples of how the, the math and science have played significant roles throughout art history. Now, I'm actually gonna turn, if Alex, if you don't mind going to the next slide, just because since we are on the topic of Da Vinci and you did such an excellent job uh, talking about him and we could be talking about Da Vinci this entire hour practically, but I feel like it is key with the three points that we were making, one being talking about perspective and linear perspective, and then um, and, and in talking about sort of another key element that I think was very important to address throughout art history is proportions. And being that Leonardo da Vinci um, is a, as you said, a polymath and was sort of this Renaissance man that explored not only science, but, as, but mathematics as well as art. And he was studying this, um, several uh, studies from the architect Vesu, uh, Vitruvius, who saw this representation of these superimposed, two superimposed figures on top of one another with their legs stretched out, um, legs and arms both stretched out and boxed like within a, a square and a circle. And it was the sort of the play on perspective and or proportions rather and understanding how the human body is the ideal example of proportions and how that relates to, to architecture and to just being able to understand how to portray it 
um, in figurative art as well. Um, so I think that this was a, a key work to, to represent sort of who, how it influenced so many others going forward. Um, and it's, from my perspective, I also find it sort of interesting because it's, um, it is showing other examples of this sort of vanishing point and, and perspective in the, in the idea of like sort of where your eyes are immediately drawn to the exterior of the hands and kind of all, just, all of a sudden, you know, it, it almost creates like a triangular shape, bringing you back to the sort of the top of the circle. And, and then the same sort of, you can find the same um, triangular shape sort of in the bottom half of the torso, torso to, the, to the feet. Um, and it, it uh, starts to sort of play not only with, with the, sh the shape of the body itself, but also just with shapes and generals and forms. Um, and uh, it's like as if, uh, one comment here. It's um, sort of the correct, I would say the correct proportions um, to for as an example of geometry as well and in relation to geometry. And, um, and what is interesting about this is that he wasn't necessarily an architect, but people could describe him as one because he incorporated all three of these fields that we're talking about. But he, of course, strongly influenced the next artist where I'm gonna be showing, which I think is Alex, the one we have, I think it's the, oh no. No, no. I'll, why is it going backwards? There we go. There we okay. go. Uh, Sorry about Le that. Gay, who um, was born in 1887. He is a Swiss French artist. He was actually as trained as an architect. And, um, and in these works, you can, in particular, the one on the left, the modular is actually an example, sort of his interpretation of what he considered to be the ideal man. Um, and, and obviously taking strong sort of being strongly influenced by the Vitruvian man, um, if you see that on sort of the left, the, the work on the right, but on the left-hand side of that. Um, but however, it's the figure itself is more aligned with what was happening at the time of like, I would say prior to the 50s, which this work was done in the 50s, but perhaps in the 20s and 30s, which was more movement of cubism and exploring sort of these deformed figures and not necessarily having the correct proportions. But it's kind of a, a sort of, I would say it's a play of like bringing what was sort of the importance of um, something significant from art history and reinterpreting it with his sort of his own understanding. Uh, and then you also sort of see these different elements. You can also see an element of a shell in the um, a light drawing on the top right hand corner, which also goes back to this whole play of what we were discussing earlier of, um, you know, perspective and, and developing like this sort of the correct perspective. Um, and then the, the one, the work on the left, um, I feel like that one is more just sort of an architectural rendering with a mix of um, different artist influences because he spent a lot of time at this point in Paris. Uh, he was in Paris from 1920s to, um, straight at, uh, until, he, uh, until he died, I'd say, if I'm not mistaken. And he, um, he was also, he worked closely while in um, publishing a lot of these prints. He worked very closely with a lot of modern masters. One in particular was Pablo Picasso. And I feel like there are, some influences from works by Picasso of uh, Guernica and a few of his nudes. You'll see like small, um, small drawings at the bottom and on the left-hand side, you sort of see these um, uh, sort of what look like, could look like uh, bulls, uh, bulls heads on either top and bottom. Um, and uh, just sort of, this is, completely different from the idea of playing with perspective. I think this this purse, this piece is a lot flatter, um, but it is, it is sort of a, I would consider a more simplified version to understand it. You, you see it more for the colors and the play of the colors and sort of the negative and positive space. And then that sort of leads well into the uh, next artist, Robert Indiana, who, um, do we have his work? Okay. 
who um, in this particular piece with Robert Indiana, I feel like it's a great example where it incorporates for both uh, da Vinci's Vitruvian man, because you see even in the star shape and the circle surrounding it and then the square, but also the, um, the idea of playing with, um, with again, with, uh, with color and text and sort of the, the, visual, um, the visual game that one has with, um, with, with a play between color and text. And he, I think, used in, in sort of a similar way to da Vinci, he used a lot of the time these simple uh, type and typesets, like he explored both numbers and uh, sort of small words, most famously for his, I would say his most famous work was the love series he did from the 60s and also a series of numbers that he sort of, he, he did as well from both uh, from doing, he, he did sculptures, paintings, drawings uh, and his most famous works are probably from the 60s. And this work is from 1998, but it is sort of ex an example of these earlier masterpieces that he did from the 60s, um, showing not only the physical number one, but the lettering one. And, and those numbers, each of the numbers that he would use, he each one had its own sort of significant influence because he as a child grew up sort of in, I would say under, under some stress, uh, under some challenging times, they, and with his parents, they moved about 21 times. Uh, and each location, his mother told him that they couldn't live there for more than a year. Uh, so, so every time he would see a number, there would be sort of a, a, a direct personal um, relationship with that number. And there is a sort of, it's autobiographical in a sense with the numbers. So, um, so I find that that's sort of an interesting way to represent language as well. It's like, there's a universal language behind it. And, um, and it kind of goes back to the whole idea of how math is considered to be like a universal language. Like you get from art, you might get a visual understanding. And for those that are illiterate, they see it visually and they might be unable to understand a story. But with math, it's, it's, you find that like it's, it, it is what it is. And it's, and it's, you know, it's sort of a clear form and it's understood as it, as it presents itself. So, and I think that that's sort of what Indiana was getting at too, so. I think we are moving on. Linda, you are up. Linda. Are you ready for your close-up? Can we unmute Linda? Of course. Hi. Yes, of course. Ah. So this is Linda Vallejo, one of BG artists, one of our BG artists here. Please um, give us a little bit about, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us a little bit about the BDP. And then we have a Dr. Sagrados after this. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Linda Vallejo, and I've been working on a series of brown works uh, that discuss the politics of color and class, culture, and power as of late. I produced um, many works beginning with a portfolio called Make Them All Mexican, in which I bought pricey antiques and painted the skin brown. One of my favorite things to do is to appropriate, or what I call reappropriate or appropriate back culture and history. Um, as I was continuing to do Make Them All Mexican, I produced, a, I don't know, close to 300 works of small sculptures and repurposed photographs and postcards and lots of uh, figurines as it were. I began, uh, I asked myself a very simple question. Uh, what would my work look like if I was a minimalist? It was a crazy question to ask and it took about four years for me, me to be able to come up with some kind of an answer after creating a, hundreds of very gaudy looking sculptures that looked a great deal, had a great deal in common actually with, uh, with truly polychromatic Grecian sculpture and of course Mesoamerican architecture and sculpture. And I had been uh, studying data uh, and a lot of the conversation in the Latin American community, Chicano community in the United States was this whole conversation about the numbers and how the numbers were gonna change everything for brown people in the United States, that uh, our growth in numbers would change everything, which I, I personally don't agree with, but it was the conversation at the time, I guess because of a voting block. And uh, what I had in my head was brown. And the only thing I had in my head really was a brown circle. I'm not sure why, but it appeared one day and there it was this big brown dot. 
And I spent five years collecting data and looking at data and studying data and the numbers, not really knowing what to do or how I was going to configure them. I started looking at uh, data graphs and data charts, pie charts, all kinds of uh, graphic forms that everyone's used to, but everyone hates to look at, hates to study. Data is not a fun thing for most people, although I do like looking at data a lot. And uh, one day I was walking in the uh, art store, you know, the artist's favorite, favorite shopping experience. And I spotted some architectural grid paper <clears throat> and uh, some kind of explicative came out of my mouth. And I realized that I could take the brown dot and plot data on architectural grid paper. And since then I've created, I don't know, I don't know, maybe maybe uh, 200 objects that are data-based uh, using math and information and presenting that in a different formula and a different formation. So in this particular context, this piece is called Los Angeles at 48.3%. That was in 2015. I believe it's, I think we're closer to 50% at this point. We are 38% of the state of California. Um, so in this particular case, you have a 10 by 10 architectural grid paper. This image is actually seven, the paper is nine by nine, but the, the image itself is seven by seven. So each square in there, you can see, uh, you can see the squares delineated by some of the darker lines are 10 by 10. 10 by 10 is 100. 100 times seven is 700. 700 times 700 is 4,900. That's how many squares there are within the, within the image itself, within the exterior dot of the image. So if you take 4,900 squares within that area and multiply it by 48.3%, you end up with 2,367. And that's how many dots are present in this piece, representing and indicating the data that 48.3% of Los Angeles was Latino in 2015. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people say that, uh, you know, um, they don't like looking at data. They don't like data graphs. I call these data pictographs. And I found a way to create all different kinds of data pictographs using architectural grid paper, uh, as well as other formulas that we'll look at in a couple of minutes. But the numbers are, can be very intriguing. 65% uh, of all women-based businesses in the United States are Latina which is a, a fact that no one even considers. Uh, so 17% uh, of, the, of the armed forces are Latino and we are 17% of the population at this time. Uh, Mexican is actually the largest, Mexican American is the largest Latino group in the United States today. I think we are 60% uh, of that group. The data is, is uh, difficult to find. You have to research online and there's not a lot being told about Latinos, especially if you wanna divide Latinos up. Uh, in terms of Cuban, Puerto Rican, South American, Central American, Mexicanos, and Mexican Americans, Chicanos. We don't divide it up like that very much. So a lot of this data work speaks about Latinos as a whole in the nation. And what I tell people is that it's a way for us to get to know ourselves and for other people to know who we are as well. One third of all Latinos in the United States are third generation American citizens, which is something very contrary to what people think about Mexican Americans and immigration today. So there's a lot that can be told. And this particular data formula or data format uh, is very grid-based obviously, but, and they look like architectural formulae, they look like aerial architectural formulas. They look like weavings. They look like a computer grid format. They look like spaceships in some cases. They look um, very, they, they, they appear very digitized and very scientific in a lot of ways as well. But, and on other hand, they look like um, Northern European weavings and uh, embroidery work. Yeah, they go just about across every culture, every race, every creed, and time spans as well. That's fantastic. Yeah. I, I can't believe there are that many dots there. How long did that take you to do? I was doing one a day. Wow. Uh, the, hardest, the, hard, the hardest part was drawing it. You have to draw it first. You have a formula, a basic formula, uh, you draw it out with a, with a non-photo blue pencil and uh, you count, you're counting as you're going, I would count 50 dots at a time and make a hash mark on a piece of paper. 
And then after I would do the first round of the basic, the basic formulation of the image itself, then I would say, well, gee, I have another, you know, 755 dots I got to do, where am I going to put them? And then you begin <laughs> creating, yeah, you begin creating other what designs or formulas um, within, within the context of the image itself. Like you can see the four objects in the center of it that kind of look like little human figures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can say that each one of those has uh, about 50 dots a piece. So I actually wow. formulated it so that I could add 200 to the image. Oh, I can add 200. And you, some of the images that I've made, this is actually very small. 2,367 dots. I have some images that have uh, over 40,000 dots. A uh, full, full figure uh, of photographic pieces where you have images of faces and images of full bodies that re represent data in a photograph, in a, what, what appears to be an all dotted photographic piece. It's incredible. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Guy Austin, yes, hello. Thank, thank you, hello. I wanna bring up Welcome. something. I'm very flattered, thank you. I'd like to bring up something Christina and Linda brought up. First off, um, data is information. And information is consciousness. Christina brought up that mathematics is universal. And what you guys brought up is what inspired me to take fractals and, and build them into real things. I saw a, a TED talk with Max Tegmark He's an MIT astrophysicist at uh, MIT. And he made a quote that blew my mind, but it turned out he stole the quote from Galileo. He stole it from a quote from the guy who invented geometry. And he pretty much said that math is not only the language of the universe, it's the fabric. And I just went, wow, let's find out. So I bumped into a word called fractal and many years ago. And I figured, well, a, a fractal is basically a pattern from nature that repeats and nature loves to reuse patterns. I've got an example here. Um, oh, here's a, a uh, I don't know if you can see it, I think you can. That's a sand dollar. And you notice it's got this, this it took out a leaf pattern on it. Now, why is that? Because it accomplishes something. If you take a fig leaf, it's got the same pattern. And it's probably, is in some way communicating, maybe exfoliating carbon dioxide or inhaling oxygen, I don't know, but it solves a pattern, a problem rather. Now, I decided to take patterns from nature, mash them up like a DJ, render them out, and, and see what kind of real world things I could make. Uh, this piece is called Wave Storm and Rocks. What I did was I took a Nautilus shell that uh, Christina, or was it? Yeah, I think it was Christina that showed. And I took a crystal, a quartz crystal. I mashed up the math like a DJ. First off, I only have a fourth or fifth grade math level, but I found a program and I used it wrong. I used everything about it wrong, but I was mashing up fractals. <laughs> and I invented making waves. I made dreadlocks. I made, I made jellyfish. I, I made... Um, birds because nature loves patterns now you see rocks here in waves now here's the thing that blew my mind when you look at a mountain like the rocky mountains i saw a time lapse of the rocky mountains it was a 30 second time lapse of the rocky mountains going from nothing to the rocky mountains and it was like swirling water turbulent water waves breaking except in this case, the waves breaking were avalanches and such. So what I did is I made a mountain fractal and I composed three of them. And then all I did, since ripples and mountains represent water, I just changed the color of the mountains. Some of it's white, some of it's blue, and, and some of it's brown like a mountain. And what do you see? You see waves and you see mountains at the same time because everything is connected. Gravity shapes everything. And mathematics is that fabric. Here is a, a barnacle. I don't know if you can be able to see it, but there's all sorts of patterns going concentric and linear and such, and it just build this shape. Reality is a, a fabric and, and atoms 
build that fabric and gravity assembles that, fragra, that, that fabric. And when you look at consciousness, human consciousness itself, what is it made of? It's made of electrons. What is matter made of? It's made of atoms and electrons. In other words, consciousness is electrons and matter is built up of atoms and electrons. Everything is connected. So with my art, I decided to build magical things and wondrous things just by combining what, uh, what are the math guys digitized. Um, I decided to explore some rocks some more. Most of my stuff is water because I'm, I'm a water fanatic. I surf, I swim. I've done like 10 Alcatraz crossings from Alcatraz to the mainland. I, I've surfed up and down the coast from Mexico to Oregon. So I'm trying to get away. So I'm going into rocks. Can we show the next one? Alex? There we go. This is my stone series. I decided to, to go inside a cave and find patterns in rocks that water made flowing. And uh, I, I added colors that, you know, I believe that minerals contain and I wanted to make it where you feel like you're inside some, a cave, you feel the dust, the dust particles, you see the beauty with your lamp. And I'm gonna explore this series some more. Now, this pattern, this rock pattern is just a wave pattern that I made edgy. That's all I did. I took water and make it edgy and then created rocks. If you look at the uh, cobblestones at the side of a river, they're essentially bubbles that, that, that the water made into, into the rock. So that's my point of view as an artist is to take reality and bend it, mix it, mash it together and just see what wondrous things can be made or have been made or could be made. Well, that's thank you guys. This reminds me, yeah, um, this reminds me a lot of um, the Devil's Canyon in Wyoming. Um, that one you. with the crazy colors. I've never been, I've only ever seen pictures, but incredible. Um, I'm gonna stop screen sharing now. Hold on. Okay. Oh, there we go. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you, Guy, for that. Uh, that and Linda, of course, they, for the um, wonderful explanations. That was very helpful, um, <laughs> and and allowed us to further uh, explore this theme um, with great examples by both of you. And uh, speaking of water and water obsessed, someone who I think is also fascinated with sailing water, and um, has a depiction of a ship is um, Mike. Uh, Saijo, and I think he's he's available and on and uh, ready to talk about his work. Mike, hi, hi. can you hear me? Yes, hi. hi. How are you? Great, good. Um, so I don't have the ship building piece here today, but I do have the um, the Ashkaga DNA piece. Fantastic. Um, so that's that's this one here. Okay. I don't know. Can you guys see okay? Yeah, no, we can see it. If so you this is a, a, a okay, great. That's yeah, that's perfect. so that's a building that was photographed that was photographed um, in Japan in, in a city called Ashikaga, which is like this uh, which is which is kind of a rundown part of like outside of Tokyo and was like a really busy uh, at one point where when there was uh, I think it was like right after the war it was really popular for creating like kimonos and textiles and like before the war is really popular and after um, in like the 80s a lot of the the economy and development moved towards like Tokyo area and so I was with a group of artists walking around the city and um, checking out different abandoned buildings and um, looking at the potential for exhibits and things. And, and as we were walking by, I saw this spiral staircase um, on the side of the building. And the way the light was hitting it, it was casting a shadow to look that made it look like a double helix, you know? And, um, and so, uh, I was interested in just capturing that and thinking about the idea of uh, genetic um, 
code within like a place within a city or something along those lines. And the pages that uh, the, the piece is printed on is a, is a book called uh, The Cosmic Serpent, DNA and the Origins of Knowledge. And uh, it's a book by Jeremy Young, who's an anthropologist who went to the Amazon to um, Venice area, just happy with the ayahuasca vine and DNA and, and how it all kind of is, uh, influences each other. So, yeah, that's what that piece is about. Is everybody still there? Sorry. Hi. I was muted there for a second. Hi. I just wanted to shoot back on the work to see it again one more time before we move move on to Okay. Cora. Okay. Um, I will do this. If we get a good glimpse and, the, the, okay. and, there, and within this, there's like other illustrations like these. Um, this one is of uh, uh, Watson, who was one of the early scientists in discovered the DNA, these, uh, these other um, diagrams of, um, uh, what do you call it, like a microcosm, a cosmovision, this is the cosmovision, yeah, so you see the tree in the middle and the snake wrapping around the tree and the house on top and where a um, little angel up there, so when you're dieting, you know, you see the sun rise from one side to the other, and uh, it's all about this world that you're in here. And um, here we have a snake. So these snakes are really interesting. The cosmic serpent, this is here. Um, the snake is really interesting because of... Sorry, Mike, I think we lost you. Mike? Hello? I'm oh, disappointed. This stuff is really neat. Oh, well, um, Mike, I guess, I guess we lost you. Um, Flora, by any chance, are you with us? Hi. Yes, I'm here. Hi. Um, you're, you're here. And do you... Uh, hi. Perfect. Great. We can see. <laughs> I'm glad, and I'm glad that you have the work right behind you. That's that's perfect. I can just move, <laughs> move out of that's the screen. Fantastic. Okay, it makes it a little bit easier. Now, I, I, I mean, I, I now I'm very curious to hear about this work because I've only seen the photos that we have. So now seeing the work displayed this way, it's 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 much clearer and much easier to visualize. So I'd love you to walk us through it. Okay. So um, this pieces from a series I've made called Lines of Desire and I'll just bring the computer up closer so you can see some of the detail but um they're overlays of the Los Angeles street grid um mm -hmm. and I've took a triple a map and um took off all the text so that the lines of um the city from the beach to downtown became kind of like a template a stamp that I could use um, to produce these pieces. Um, so they're actually silk screen overlays and um, each piece is unique. It's, um, I'm using silk screen, but not following any of the rules of silk screen. So there's no registration. Um, I've, I've also made versions where I'm kind of introducing the mistakes of printmaking, like all the splatters um, and kind of like, the faded impressions that you get from cleaning out the screen um, into the work itself. And it's titled Lines of Desire because I was thinking about um, this term in landscape architecture is called desire lines and it's the fastest way from point A to point B. So it's actually the path that's trod through the grass um, as opposed to the programmed path um, by the city of these networks of streets and sidewalks that people are supposed to be using. And so I wanted to kind of play on that idea and think about the city as this locus of dreams um, and kind of desires that, you know, people move 
through the city. Um, for me, I'm often going to like the same points over and over again, mm -hmm. you know, over time and kind of thinking about this pattern of paths that builds up over time. And um, with this particular piece, I wanted to um, try to evoke that idea of, um, of, you know, movement and also um, the disappearance of, um, of our memory of, the, of this passage um, over time. And um, I've made kind of versions of this um, very large scale. So, you know, 10 feet by eight feet um, and also these smaller pieces that are more fit for a domestic setting. Um, and how I've also, oh, sorry, how I'm are sorry? they installed? I'm just looking at them, how are they installed? Um, they're just, uh, you know, installed on a grid. These are a uh, one foot square, so, um, yeah, one foot square with two inches in between. Um, okay. nine what are they eight. mounted on? Yeah, it's it's just on panel, so it's um, paper on on wood panel. Um, the larger pieces I did were on vellum, so um, just you know something I can roll up and install very easily. And I've also done versions of these street grid pieces on um, tar paper, so the black tar paper that's used for roofing. Um, it, with kind of a silvery um, paint for the lines. Um, and the texture of the tar paper starts to interfere with the print and it breaks it up and it starts to read as like stars or, um, you know, the city, city from above at night. And I kind of also love the tar paper City of Angels series um, because LA is a city that's built on tar fields and that tar um, is very low grade and it's only used for roofing and roads. And I thought that, you know, I like the, the way the material starts to reinforce the theme of the work. Well, thank you. That was great. Um, really enjoyed it. And um, I'm, again, I'm really happy to be able to see it the way that it's been presented just because the, the photos don't do it justice. So, so that's, I'm glad that we were able to do this. Um, and now I think I'm gonna turn it to Peter Carr, who I think is also joining us today. We have a few other artists uh, here, but I'm hoping we have time for everyone. So hi, Peter, how are you? Oh, you're, I think you're muted. Can we... How's that? Okay. Good. Hi, how are you? Good. I'm very well, thank you for you. having me. Yeah, no, and I mean, we were talking just now about the uh, tar, which I didn't know if that'd be a good transition to the black hole, but I figured, you know, so, some some connection can be made there. <laughs> well, um, without I mean, without getting into um, you know, my background and all the, I'll, I'll talk about the pieces, but if, if interested, I can, my bio is on my um, website at, at futuredogsurf.com. But if I may, I'd like to um, just quickly discuss, you know, what, what goes into what I do with my art and, you know, the basic um, background of them. And mostly I, I would call my art jokingly fractal wavelism because I like repeating images and I, you know, I'm, I, I'm like GK Austin, I'm a, longtime surfer so waves are you know sort of embedded in everything I do in my life and 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 most of my I would say my art is very technical in terms of technical drawing and with a background in in, in mathematics I studied that in college um, I really really like you know involving different forms of mathematics and just about all of my pictures that I, I produce and and it's mostly geometric using vectors and tangents um, and you know linear curvature and everything's you know done by hand. And I include motifs that I really like. Like I like floral patterns and and and, and but mostly with the pieces in relation to what we talked about. And I'm gonna stand up and come back. This piece right here, and I've got them back here for you to see. Is is um, is my um, I have two of them here, but the one you wanted to talk about was the uh, cosine chirp confection and. The name just confection is because my kids looked at it and it looked like cotton candy to them. <laughs> it sort of does. I mean, I love the colors, but 
what I have here is I have like a, a, a primary spot, a focal point where these, these bisecting diagonal and horizontal and vertical lines come together to a reflection point where these sine and cosine wavelengths cross through and are translated from one center point to another. And, and, and what these are known in, in science are called chirp signals. And a chirp signal is used in, um, in sonar technology. And, and just to kind of give you an, an idea of like on a submarine where you hear the, the sound bouncing from one to another and you can tell where they are. And, you know, this, and also, you know, the term chirp actually comes from what a bird sounds like. So if you hear a bird chirp, what happens is that the actual interval, which are all these intervals along these axes are the same, but the frequency may vary. And so it was referred to as a chirp signal. And in this case, what I have going on is basically a lot of repeating motifs and waves and different forms that are kind of running into each other and translating to the other side. And also something religious in that, and that there's a sense of hope and a creationism, but there's these mutant waves, which are the part that frightens me as the ocean gets larger and bigger. Um, waves are becoming enormous and the sea levels are rising. So I sort of take that in consideration with these pieces. And that's basically what's going on with this one. And this one is 48 by 24 on masonite wood panel. So when I do them, I sort of construct them all and hand draft them going from light shade to dark shade. Um, and I kind of develop these two different color path, two different color um, sequences. So like there'll be maybe three or four in one color shade and then another with a light tone to each. So you see, I go from dark to light on almost many of my paintings. So that's the situation with that. And directly behind me are the black hole paintings. <laughs> and we don't necessarily know what's on the other side of black holes. And so that, if you can see the image on your, if you can put it up on your screen and I'll walk back from it. Mm -hmm. Black holes I find extraordinarily fascinating to me. The amount of gravitational pull within a black hole is so strong that not even light can make it through it, or at least so much we know. And light is the, is the most powerful entity within the universe and it gets sucked into a black hole. And in the middle of a black hole, the point of singularity the black hole is so dark that and, and powerful that everything just gets absolved and no one really knows what's on the other side of black holes. Um, so this is just my idea of this utopian world of all my motifs and waves and vectors and everything coming out in sort of a graphic color. Um, but what's interesting and I wanted to kind of bring up is that I wanted something that really represented what a black hole is. So I make my own frames the mat and the spacer, and I use this paint called BLK 3.0. I'm not trying to sell it, but it's similar to Vanta Black. I'm not sure what you know if, if you're familiar with Vanta Black. Mm -hmm. Have you heard it of it? It be the blackest black pigment that yeah, there ever was. Yeah, really fascinating stuff. I think BMW came out with a BMW that was Vanta Black, and it's so dark that as light comes into it, it absorbs. It's like almost a Reader's Digest version of uh, of it is that it's a tubular matrix within the chemical compound that absorbs as much light and becomes super black. So the only commercially available artistic black is this BLK 3.0. And I did everything um, using it, making the painted the spacer, the made the frames, painted the frame in the mat. So it sort of had that sense of that singularity point in the middle of the black hole. So that was kind of like the concept. Um, very challenging paint to work with. It's an acrylic paint. So, um, and then the paint is, uh, the actual paintings are gouache and it's a triptych in which they can be arranged in any configuration, which is sort of the same I do in all my paintings with the two chirp signal paintings behind me. They can be hung in all four directions, whatever the viewer wants. And, and that's how I like it to be. So okay. that's pretty much it. Well, Thank you so much. Appreciate the explanation and the fact that we were able to see the, the works all behind you in the studio. That's always helpful. And um, I think we have time for one more, which is um, who Thank is you, patiently way. waiting. Um, Matt thank you, James. Peter. What? Sorry? I said thank you, Peter. Thank you. Sorry, I said thank you. 
Yeah, no, I'm just now waiting to hopefully Matt James is still present with us and he can participate as well. All right. Um, hello. Hello. Hey, did that work? I, I can hear you. I just can't see. Oh, uh, no. Oh, there we go. Hi, how hey, are uh, you? Good. Hi, everybody. Well, thank you for being patient. And I'm glad you have that. your work ready to go and to discuss it. <laughs> It was good to hear what everyone had to say. It was, I learned a lot today already. So good, here I am, <laughs> what's that? I'm, I said, good, I'm glad, that's the whole point. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to show you my studio here. This is a bunch of roughly uh, 13, by 13 by 13, 14 by 14 new assemblage pieces that I've been working on that are all mathematical in, in theory. Can you see this well? Yeah, does this work? Yeah, it is, it's hard because you're, maybe if you go, yeah, that might be a little bit better if it's able to just focus on one and maybe are you able to. Does that work there? Yeah, that's yeah. better. So I'm, I'm new to this, so I don't know how to make adjustments nope, no on my phone. So there you have it. That one's about a couple weeks old in a series of, well, I guess there's nine of them now, but there's a whole lot more of them. And it's all math that sort of finds itself. I don't know exactly. I'm seeing these squares with numbers in them and automatically thinking of the Indiana I just showed. So I just, I mean, I see that that square with uh, four twos in it. I'm just wondering uh, if there was any influence <laughs> from Indiana. Well, I, I use the number two in all my work. Um, okay. I guess math has different meanings for me. All the numbers are actually pretty specific, but then I have them pretty jumbled up also so that they're almost like hieroglyphics and the actual numerical equation doesn't matter at all. But the math involved, I don't want to be in the picture. I'm trying to, <laughs> there you go. Okay. And that's these are, you know. I just there, if you keep that steady, that's great. Cool, it's hard for me because the, the whole time I've had a big waiting sign right in the middle of my screen. Oh. So I've, I've kind of missed out on a lot of images. Oh, but these are all made out of uh, wooden matches. And I think a lot of the math involved is simply how long these things take to make. They're wooden matches and popsicle sticks and they're done on sides as well. Let's see, how do I do this? Oh, yeah, we can. So, um. uh, I give up on that. That's not really working out. <laughs> okay. What is the, can you tell us what is the significance of the number two? Why did you decide to use it in all of your pieces? Uh, all my friends were assigned a number back when we were kids and mine was 12, but after everything, it changed to two. So it's so basically, it's a signature, but that it's has the representation of all my old friends that aren't around anymore. And the central piece is like an oculus? I think I left. Oh. No, nope, we got you. Oh, we got you. I see that there's like a framing device in the center almost, like with a photograph. Oh, this one doesn't have any photographs. The one I'm trying to do in the center. <clears throat> if I could flip my camera around, it'd be so much easier. So sure. here we have a lens and there is a photograph and behind it, there's more collage. Oh, okay. And that's three dimensional here. That's so interesting. Now the paper in the background of that is from 1876. Everything is very old. <laughs> Here's the number two. And you can see each one, there's a, uh, a lens. So it's very personal. I mean, well, artwork in general is personal. It's hard to say that it's not, but it's very personal to you. That's 
It's a really unique signature. Ah, thank you. There's some other ones that happen. Sorry, I lost my voice. That's all right. <laughs> Are you all right? Thank you. Okay, I gotta go. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we are going to turn it over to um, Daniel Brandt, who is joining us from Germany. Um, hello, sir. Hello over there. Uh, Daniel Brandt is part of um, a, a group called Brandt Brower Frick, but also a solo artist. And uh, please forgive me if I um, misintroduce you at all, but um, he, Correct. I know that you work with uh, mathematics in your sound compositions. So we are going to, we actually have a piece included in our, um, in our exhibition here, um, a limited edition song um, that we have a kind of multi, a multimedia experience that we're gonna show in just a moment. But Daniel, if you would like to, um, if you would like to just chat really briefly about your influences, how the mathematics part, mathematics part works for you yeah. and um, all of those things, we, we're all ears. Sure. Um, well, basically um, our music is heavily influenced by the 60s uh, minimal music, American minimal music, and also Detroit techno from the 80s, um, which is all very organized music and um, but still very emotional and powerful, but it's it's a lot based on mathematics. I mean, techno, just because of the means that were used to create it, the 303 and all the synthesizers, which have a mathematic, like a 16 beat uh, possibility where you can fill in things. Uh, but we are doing it with uh, like real instruments, basically. So we have this 10 piece ensemble of classical instruments um, that we work with and um, our, all our compositions are First, normally starting in some kind of jam session scenario with the three of us, the Brandt, Brau, Frick guys. And um, then we kind of create patterns and, that, and create more and more patterns on top of each other. And then basically create a lot of polyrhythmic structures out of these uh, patterns that we created in the beginning. And, um, and basically using it, like sculpting it in a way. So basically we have a lot of stuff in the beginning and it kind of comes down to around 10 elements, as you will see in the video, um, this is, always has to be able to be played by the 10 musicians that we have on stage. So um, we go through different phases of composition for our pieces first, yeah, allowing everything into it and then kind of creating these structures that are mostly based on polyrhythmic things and also phasing, we use a bit of phasing, which is this kind of technique where the polyrhythmic structure kind of slowly goes out of the spectrum basically first they are in line and they're kind of slowly how do you call it uh yeah passing away from each other and then kind of coming back to each other again like steve reich for example did a lot of that in his compositions for example the six pianos piece and we are also performing that actually very often so yeah this is kind of how it works awesome okay we'll show the uh we'll show the video now so laura if you could please take care of that for us.
That's incredible. So that's the kind of stacking, layering that you're talking about? Exactly. I mean, this is already the boiled down version for 10 instruments. So that's what happened after we went through different phases of composition. That's the end result, the very end result. Because, yeah, we're basically just three people starting together the pieces and then later on these people play it. So basically we just jam first and we, you know, create. There, were, there used to be much more in that song already uh, in an earlier version, of course. And we kind of have to boil it down to the essence in a way and um which is also a good kind of uh yeah self-made uh restriction to not over uh, yeah to not uh, have too much stuff in there right that's something and i constantly tell myself edit 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 <laughs> exactly <laughs> well we first add a lot and then we remove a lot yeah that's my approach in life <laughs> it's fine <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's so fascinating. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I'm going to put your group name here just for everybody. Um, we have a limited edition piece, as I mentioned, um, a limited edition song that Daniel has uh, contributed to this exhibition here. But the band, the ensemble is Brent Brower Flick. And you can find them on Spotify and things like that. And the song that we just listened to was Mask. Um, and, uh, I guess we're going to open up for questions now, Those, you know, please feel free to unmute yourself, say hello, let us know what you're thinking, um, ask any questions and, uh, we will have our artists and whomever answer them the best that we can. Questions? I feel like there were so many exciting things. It's I feel like maybe people I know there are a lot of things watching. to process. <laughs> there's 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 definitely been a lot to digest. I mean, uh, from a wide range. We started with an art historical lesson and then ended with a beautiful private concert. So, um, so I can understand why people might not have had that many questions now at this point, um, but. If there are any more questions and people just don't want to feel comfortable asking them, you can ask them in the chat and we can we can ask the artists them ourselves. Or if you'd prefer to email either one of us, I'm happy to put our information in the chat so that everyone can just email us uh, separately and, and we can always ask answer any of your questions. Um, And if you'd like to share your email with us, um, if you're joining for the first time or and you'd like to see more of these kinds of events or learn anything about the exhibition itself, learn anything about the artists within, please feel free to share your um, email address with us. Again, I'm Alex. That's my co-host, Christina. Hi. And also <laughs> would love to tell you that this ex exhibition is um, on display online on Artsy. Um, and uh, we, we did put, I think we put in the link right here, but we can, you know, here so that everyone has it. Um, I'll just put it back in. Um, oh, no, that's not it. Sorry, one second. Let's see if I can, I think everyone might have it, but let me just make sure here. That way everyone can check out the exhibition. Now that we it's fresh in your mind and we just discussed all of it, um, you can check it out on Artsy and also on the BG website as well. And let us know if you have any questions. Uh, happy to answer anything. Uh, <laughs> as as uh, many of the artists know, I'm you know, open to many different kinds of discussions, uh, as is Alex. So um, don't, don't be shy. No question is a bad question. And uh, look forward to hearing from everyone. And thank you for those uh, for the artists who joined us. And uh, thank you for um, being participating, uh, and also for uh, just join the, the guests that joined us. And Alex, good. good thank to you so much, artists. Um, you know the same thing. Peace to you, Linda. Everybody, um, this was such an interesting, um, such an interesting conversation and discussion. And you guys are all such. Um, the way that you approach everything from math and science, um, which to me seems so completely separate from art, is, is 
truly fascinating. So you guys have definitely taught me something today. I hope that everybody else feels like they've come away with something that they learned as well. Um, so I, there are no questions. I guess we will say goodbye. Everybody go out there and vote.